really love a movie or TV show or book or whatever, how do you talk about it to other people? Do you lean into the hype and the hyperbole, or do you try to temper your excitement about it a little bit so they don't get underwhelmed when they do check it out? Absolutely the latter. It's tough though, right? But I also, I think, project quite a bit in that sense because I highly prioritize context and entry point. Like if there's a podcast I like, I'm not going to tell someone to check it out. I'm going to say this particular episode is something you should check out because it is a good entry point. And usually that's individualized because it's not like that episode is good generally. It's like, hey, this is them interviewing a person that you already like and maybe you would like to learn more or something like that so that mm -hmm. I can say, if you don't like that one, you probably won't like the rest of them. Whereas if someone's like, oh, yeah, check that out. I, I, I've seen that before and blah, blah, blah. And I go, OK, well, which episode was it? And I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a garbage episode. Like, we still don't know if you like it or not. Oh, no, that's that's tricky, though. That's tricky because now, now you're trying to invalidate how they felt about like, oh, you just didn't watch it the right way. You didn't listen to the right episode. Why would it be invalidating how they feel if I feel the same way about that particular one? Uh, because you arrived at that bad one in a context that made it understandable for you that the next one wouldn't be so bad. The, the order in which you approach the art has affected your appreciation of the art and the order in which they're coming to the art matters too. But how is, how is that any different than saying it gets better mm, you get you can certainly make the argument i'm just saying it gets tricky because on an emotional level to be told that your gut reaction to a piece of art was wrong or under informed in some way can kind of rub someone the wrong way i think because if you tell me like oh you just listened to the wrong episode i'd be like oh well, maybe no maybe your show sucks well th that's why i say well i, I mean that's that's pretty broad though, right? Like you, you dig in and you say like, well, why did you not like that episode? Is it because of this, 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 and this? Okay. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is instead of trying to build a case against that, uh, just kind of like admit it and build it that way. So, that, oh man, that's really too bad that that's the first one that you saw because I hated that one too. It would have been awesome if you saw this episode first. And then that, that kind of does validate their opinion. Oh, I see. You're you're not saying that like okay, I I was thinking of it more broadly. I I didn't realize you meant like how it was positioned. Like still still delivering the same information just positioning it differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I thought you meant like <laughs> I thought you meant like oh, like l allowing that nagging thing in your mind of like oh, they they happen to catch the same episode that you know is the like rotten one of the batch. And you just let that go. Yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't say let it go. This is something that I talk to my students about all the time with The Simpsons. I'll explain to them, like, you guys are in a tough spot with The Simpsons because when you guys turn it on Sunday evenings, it's average. It's kind of funny. Whereas when I was your age, I turn on The Simpsons Sunday night and I'm in for one of the best half hours of television ever produced. And it's impossible for you guys to go back and see seasons, you know, two through eight or whatever you want to deem the golden years of The Simpsons without knowing that it's going to end up where it is now, even though I've heard that The Simpsons has been pretty strong the past couple seasons. I do think... That is a different phenomenon, though, because I have a similar feeling about any generation that has seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and have not seen Seinfeld. Yeah, but these these contexts do matter. Those contexts do matter. Yes, I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that if you have the ability to correct the context, that's different. Mm, I don't like I don't I don't like that verb correct. I don't, I don't know if there is a correct context. Uh, further inform the context? Uh, I don't know if that sits well with me either. The, is the goal to have them like what you like? No. No, the, the goal is to actually understand if they don't like it because of the missing context or they actually don't like it. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Please do. So I, I watched the first 
half of the first episode of Succession twice. Oh, we talked about this, yeah. <laughs> I think we've even talked about this on the podcast. Oh, maybe. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if we have, but uh, if we have. Oh, wait, you're, you're, you're not getting, you're struggling to get into Succession. Right. I, I watched, I, I couldn't even finish the first episode. Multiple attempts. I will tell you now that it is currently, having seen every episode now, top 50 shows of all time. Okay. Did you, did you need more context or did yes. you need more time to appreciate it? I need. What context were you given? Because I haven't seen Succession. So. Tell, tell me what I need to know. The context I needed is one, knowing what it was building to, and two, knowing the intent. And those are a little vague, but in that way, this isn't the easiest to articulate example, but it is a good example where I can say on the receiving end, I am so glad that people were persistent about saying, because Multiple people said to me, you know, have you seen Succession? Whatever. I think that you would love it. Mm -hmm. And I said, no. And they go, well, how far into it did you go? They're like, if you didn't go three episodes in, you haven't given it a go. And that mm. feels elitist. I, it does kind of bug me when people say, this show's great. You've got to skip the first season. Or you don't, you can't skip the first season, but it kind of sucks. So you have to kind of like grind through it, and then things get bad again in the middle of season three, and then season four is terrible, which you have to watch to understand season five. Because well, there are two, and and maybe maybe I haven't articulated this well enough, but I think it's the difference between a recommendation and an individualized recommendation. Sure, because sure. Yeah. When someone says, I'll, I'll give you the the opposite example. I've seen the first season of Game of Thrones. I hate Game of Thrones. <laughs> the difference is that every time someone told me that I just needed to make it through another episode, another whatever with Game mm -hmm. of Thrones, it had nothing to do with them saying, I think you would like it. It had everything mm -hmm. to do with them saying, you need to get through it. When someone says, oh, I think you would like this, that means something different to me. Because... I I think I think music is a shared language between the two of us, right? Yeah. There are if you randomly pick 30 bands out of my compact disc collection, <laughs> your your car booklet. Right. If you pick them out and I say these 5 are the best out of this 30. That is different than me saying to you, "Oh, out of this 30, Sonny, these two I think you'll like and here's why." I, I think the people who do broad recommendations because they think something is objectively good ruin it for those of us who both prefer to give and receive tailored individual recommendations. What I've leaned towards later in life is using my I statements on things like this. And I'll just say, for example, I feel Home Alone is a perfect film. It means a lot to me. I watch it all the time. And if you haven't seen it, you can take that for what it is. That I really enjoy it. I think people should watch it. And just say how I feel about it and let those people check it out or not check it out based on my praising of it, if that makes sense. Instead of saying, bro, you got to see this thing. But you're, I mean, you're still talking about people, right? Not a person, right? Like, you're, you're still uh, kind yeah, of framing yeah, 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 yeah. it as a what people do or people don't do. Like, to me, it's a person thing. Like if Yeah, yeah. And if you can individualize it and say, I think you would really enjoy this. You're the kind of person that I think would love this movie, love this podcast, whatever. Then that that's great. When you're wrong, it stings all the more, though. But doesn't that just make me better? <laughs> that you recommend something that someone didn't like? Yeah, because in that sense, it's giving me more context on that person, which is helpful. Oh, you're, you're sharpening your own algorithm? Yeah, like tell me why you didn't like it. <laughs> I just feel bad when someone doesn't like something that I recommend, especially a book. You give someone a book, it's like, here you go, spend 12 hours, 15 hours with this thing, and they come back to you going, I hated it. At, at the risk of going way too deep into the weeds without touching home alone on this i, I <laughs> we're 20 minutes in and we have it i i have to know the last time you recommended a book that was a tailored recommendation you said you like this type of thing i think you 
would like this book because it's that type of thing. What was the thing you missed that made it not a good recommendation? Uh, here's what, when we're talking about books, I'm talking about my students, usually. The big part of my job is books and putting books into the hands of young people. And probably my most common mistake is eyeballing a kid and seeing a little bit of myself in them and assuming that the stuff that I instantly loved when I was their age will be instantly loved by them if I just put it in their hands. Probably my most frequent failure is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'll see a kid, they like sci-fi stuff, they like funny stuff, they seem to be into sort of like that wry British humor kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, I got the perfect book for you. Here you go. And it just doesn't flip a switch in their brain the way that it flipped a switch in mine. Are they reading other things of that era? Mm, I don't think so. Because I think that would be the thing that I'd want to figure out is like, okay, a kid likes Blink-182. Sure. I saw one at yearbook camp the other day, by the way. A kid that likes Blink-182? Yeah, the shirt on it at least. Okay. Well, there you go. That kid might like The Descendants because that is where all of that came from. Mm -hmm. But if that kid is not interested in going back on the journey to what made the music he likes, then he's probably not in a place to take that. But if I know a kid who's listening to Blink-182 and is like, oh, I'm going back and trying to find, you know, what came before this. And I've been listening to Screeching Weasel and Propagandi and I'm like, oh, Descendants, you should check out that and see how you feel about that. I did have a success like this with a young person a few months ago. He was getting into a little bit of punk rock kind of stuff, but it was those mm, early, mid 2000s, like some 41 okay. kind of stuff. Yep. He had just heard some 41 and it was getting into that. And I sat him down and I threw a couple things at him. But one thing I threw at him that that clicked was Goldfinger. Right. I was like, you're ready for Goldfinger. If some 41, if you think some 41 is good, I think I can shift you into this track of Goldfinger. And he came back and really responded to it. Well, and if you listen to Goldfinger for a year, then it's pretty easy to get to Aquabats. But it's harder Ooh, yeah. to go from some 41 to Aquabats. Yeah, that might be true. That might be true. And that's why I again say that doesn't even make Aquabats a bad recommendation, but it means that the context I'm yeah, relying on the, for making my recommendation matters. And that's why I want to continue to refine my ability to see what that thing you need is next. Yeah, I get that on a, on a very personal level. Can you convince anyone to like Home Alone? Those are That's a different question because can I convince anyone to like Home Alone? Yes. Does that mean that that is objectively the right thing to do? Because it might be that we're both <laughs> wrong and given enough context, we discover that Home Alone is indeed terrible. I've made it 26 minutes so far in a weekly deep analysis of it so far. Still great. I'm right there with you. Should we see if 27 does it in for both of us? <laughs> Let's hold it up to close inspection and find out. Let's get that microscope going. It's time for the Home Alone critique. <laughs> what else could we be forgetting? Ab about what? That's the first line of this minute. Uh, oh, what, I'm sorry. What happens in this yes. minute? Minute 27. The 27th you, minute. You tell me. You tell I'll me. I'll tell you. So we start in the plane. We're picking up on the conversation we left with last week, last minute, between the father and the mother. Feels a bit strange, but we'll go with it. They realize that it's in fact Kevin that they forgot. We cut to Kevin doing a bit of a sled launch out his front door and then end up back where we came from in the plane again with a near catatonic Kate. <laughs> We've got a classic Home Alone minute back and forth. The old ha in and out. Ham bath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What else could we be forgetting? What else could we be forgetting? We could be forgetting something that we forget on a lot of episodes, which is the unsung hero. So I'll go ahead and do it while I'm thinking about it, which is sure. Larry Nichols. Thoughts? Who, who's, who's that? He is a stunt performer. 
Oh, okay. And I have to admit, this is not the scene I think of when I think of him. No. But I think you and I might actually think of the same scene. What scene do you think of when you think of him? It's got to be. Let's count to three and say it. What, what, uh, we'll, we'll see how this works out. Yeah, yeah. One, two, three. Zip tree line. house? Yeah. I said zip line. You said tree house. Tomato, potato. <laughs> Very clearly a small man. <laughs> More elegantly done here. I think we do have a small man in Kevin's clothes. He is properly bundled in this scene. Riding the sled, but it's a little less noticeable. Uh, Great work, Larry. To back up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, well done. Come on the podcast anytime. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Because I don't Ooh, know if you've maybe, seen maybe. his IMDb, but dude is busy. Ooh, maybe he can carve out a minute of his time. Tell us what it was like to put on Kevin's clothes and zip line into a treehouse. Another moment, just like this one, where Kevin just goes, whoa, for way too <laughs> <Yeah>. long. <laughs> yes, he does. He does really go after the woes a few times <laughs> sorry you you i think you wanted to go to earlier in the minute i wanted to get very dark because thinking about parents realizing that they left their kids and i was doing some research on that and like just a, a research on like the psychology of like mother's intuition and gut feelings and stuff like that and a lot of it led led me down to those tragic instances where the parents will leave their child in the back of the car Oof. and then go to work, go inside the store or whatever. And the what's going on in, in a parent's brain when they leave a child somewhere. Thankfully, that's that's not Kevin here, but it, it's a similar it's a similar psychological misfire going on. Right. So I'm, I'm looking at the stuff and, and looking at like, well, why does this happen? And it seems to happen through an interruption of routine, which was definitely the case for the McAllisters here. And an increase in stress definitely going on in here. And that thing of, I, I was reading up on like mother's intuition, like when, when moms get that, like that gut feeling that, oh, their kid's in trouble. Like you'll hear moms, you know, just get a, a bad feeling while they're at the store and then they'll they'll call the babysitter at home or whatever and, and notice that they just woke up and crying. A lot of that's down to routine and practice. So what seems like gut instinct is actually just you in sync with the rhythms of you and your baby's day and stuff like that. Their but cycles you, are aligned. Yeah. So when you disrupt those things, and you're under a heightened amount of stress, that's when you can be subject to these mistakes of leaving your kid somewhere. And it was interesting to see this minute, front end and tail end, and Kevin being okay in the middle. So Kate's suffering, but we as the audience are seeing that Kevin's fine. He's riding his sled down the stairs. But that, that Kevin, that Kevin that she yells out, maybe one of the most famous lines of the movie, right? Speaks mm -hmm. to that guilt of something that I think isn't really her fault in any way, but she's got to process all that in this minute. Does that make Home Alone a bit misogynistic in that it's trying to discredit mother's intuition with all of this newfangled science? <laughs> I think that's just me. Um, I think if anything, Home Alone... Home Alone's fine. You're a misogynist. Is that what we're saying? You're like, listen, women don't have anything that I don't have. I don't have any sort of intuition, so I have to find some way to explain well, this. Well, I think what Home Alone does invest in is the narrative, the belief that we culturally share that a mother's love for her child can make her do extraordinary things, that there are no limits to it. She'll do anything to protect her kids, get back to her kids, save her kids, that kind of stuff. I mean, we, we see physical evidence of that all the time, right? The lifting a car for a baby kind of thing, like adrenaline yeah. is real and all that. But in all seriousness, I do think there's a distinction to be made between her thinking that Kevin's not okay versus what I think you just said, which is that she's still processing it. Because whether he's okay or not isn't even really where she is. It's that she's now recognized she's left her son at home. So that in itself 
is the terrible feeling. It doesn't even matter if he's in any sort of danger or if he's dead from sledding out the door or whatever. <laughs> She's saying, I've left an eight-year-old at home. This yeah. is very bad. Even if he's totally fine right now, that's a liability. I just like the down, up, down even further rhythms of this minute of Kate knowing something's wrong, realizing Kevin's at home. And then we see Kevin just messing around. It's time for him to ride a sled down the stairs. And then we cut back to clearly some time has passed, but she's still sort of in a daze. And we've started this process of trying to call home and figure things out. Well, and it's very true to not just their characters, but who their characters represent. Because an eight-year-old is going to react differently than a mother to being left home alone. E even if he didn't think it's magic of family disappearing, he's still going to be probably doing what he's doing. Yeah, it's, a, it's another indulgence. He's eaten the Sundays. He's jumped on the bed. He's watched the naughty movie. He's raided his brother's stuff. You got to think that Kevin's always wanted to ride the sled down the stairs. And now he gets to. Kate has lived long enough to develop very real, very reasonable fears about what could happen to an eight-year-old left home alone. Knowing her helpless son, too. Right. He can't even pack his suitcase. That's been established within the film. For those of you who haven't listened... This is actually the 27th, 28th even episode. Some people were maybe recommended to start here as their entry point. The eight-year-old does not have the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom to think about what could possibly go wrong. He doesn't know how much danger he might be in right, right. now. Blissfully unaware. On a scale of zero to ten, zero being this doesn't bother me at all, and ten ruining the movie for you, how how much does it bother you that this this path of the top of the stairs down out the door, even by looking at it for the way they give it to you in the movie, is physically impossible? It used to be a seven. It's floated down to a four. I think that's exactly where I am. It used to really bug me. And now, maybe through this podcast, too, I've come to accept the movie magic as part of the appeal of the movie. There's also the part where I think about how wrong the angle is versus how wrong an eight-year-old might get the angle. To have your sled on the closest side of the stairs to the door, as opposed to the far side so it angles to go out. And this is probably really hard to follow for someone who hasn't <laughs> just looked at which side the sled is on. But if I can encourage our listeners to just look at that, he actually goes to what I think we as adults would intuitively know is not the angle, even in movie magic land. But he does what I think an eight-year-old would, which is go closer to the door. Oh, yeah, because he needs to go far he needs to make that sh straight line as best he can even but even that would be impossible there's no straight shot down these stairs through this door which maybe we see in his eyes because we do get the shot of him lining it up and he doesn't really seem satisfied on anything that he settles on he aims though he carefully aims and then he yeah he throws a scarf back around his neck and then tilts forward enough to where he should already be going down the stairs. But then we get the teetering shot. Yes, yes. Another thing that, again, previously had bugged me, but now I'm like, eh, it, it's all part of it. There's a lot of cuts in this little sequence. There's a lot going on. It's, it's at a fast and furious pace, both uh, just the adjectives and the film franchise. There's probably a lot going on both on set and in universe in the scene. Right. We're coordinating with stunts. We're trying to get different angles. We're going from interior to exterior. Well, we have that point of view shot, too, where the camera's on the sled, sort of teetering, about to head down. And then it reverses and you see Kevin's woe face there, too. Well, that's why I say if, if you just think about the inertia of the very first shot of him starting to teeter when you're seeing him. Mm -hmm. He'd be he'd be going down the stairs. But then when it cuts to point of view, it's more teetery. It's like, oh, this should have been going down the stairs already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't quite match up there. When he's leaving, when the camera goes outside and we get a shot of him soaring 
out of the door too. He's already airborne in a way that doesn't seem practical. Well, even before that, what slope launched him into the air? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 my point. Because it seems like I would I would accept like the door jam at the bottom. Is that the door jam? What do you call that? Yeah, yeah. Hitting the doorway that launching him, but when he comes out, we're we're both like using our hands <laughs> <laughs> to explain this a lot. He's all he's soaring over that the doorway as if he's already hit some sort of ramp. Which conflicts with the very straight, very much on the ground shot we've just seen before of him sliding through the vestibule. Yeah. I love that shot too. The side the side shot. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little clumsy, but we buy it. This is an exciting moment of the movie. Do you think it was irresponsible <laughs> to put this into a film that many children would watch? And want to, the, I mean, this is probably the most imitated scene from the movie. It's gotta be. It has to be. And probably led to more real life injuries than any other imitated portion. Yeah. Cause you get a little aftershave on your cheek. Okay. Well, and I, I got to think that there are some kids out there who treated their parents or siblings like some wet bandits here and there. Some kids got a paint can to the to the face, but not many. But I bet a lot of kids try to ride down their stairs on a sled. So prior to this movie, I had jumped on the bed and I had eaten popcorn, but I'd never done them together. How was it? Kind of like the POV camera work in this scene. <laughs> Fun, but clumsy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, how do you feel about his head shake? I love it. I think it's great. I wouldn't say it's I like even that. like the, the moment before. I like the moment before where he sort of just totters over and falls into the snow. Because <laughs> like, he's just so of bundled this... up. Yeah, yeah. And stiff. Yeah. <laughs> he, just, he just flops over. And also, it's such an abrupt end. It's, it's interesting to contrast this with the saucer sled scene from christmas vacation with john hughes where it's like this lightning fast like you know expedition down a down a down a hill and this one's just down the stairs out of the house and then you just fall over (laughs) into the snow right outside your house he doesn't sail across the street he doesn't you know land in the in the neighbor's yard or anything he just goes a few yards and falls over and goes (laughs) It's it's very reminiscent of the visuals we see in A Christmas Story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Really. The kid who can't yeah. move with his coat. Just mega bundled. Just That's just always funny. Can I share with you um, what the script says happens at the end of this moment? If you promise to tell me how they phonetically spelled out. Ooh. Oh, you know what? Uh, they don't write it out as dialogue. What a disappointment. Exterior porch dusk they call it this was done at dusk in the script uh kevin shoots out of the door jumps the porch and crashes in the yard kevin rolls over dazed and sore he's taking a big hit he sits up and rubs his roasted ass jared i don't even want to say roasted it. roasted but but john hughes uses a different word bottom we're a clean podcast um, he glances around slowly. The sun is setting. A florid, yellow, purple, and black winter sunset. Kevin looks up. The bare trees move in the breeze. Kevin is getting nervous. He looks across the street to old man Marley's house. Marley is scraping his front walk with a snow shovel. Kevin freaks. The lights go on. Kevin jumps up and runs into the house and slams the door. Not in the movie. I was about to say, were we deprived of the scene or was this merged with a similar scene where the I'm not afraid anymore that we haven't seen yet, admittedly? Yeah, yeah. But I'll let you know when we get to it. Okay, we shall see. But we won't find out yet because the phones are still out of order. That's right. We're back on that plane. We got Leslie and Frank there. Who could want a warmer couple by your side? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Did you notice John Hurd's bit of acting here with the flight attendant? No. What's he doing? So with Kate being semi-catatonic, the flight attendant comes over again, delivers the news that the pilot's trying some. I don't know what a pilot would be calling back. Only the pilot's allowed to use the phone on a plane. We know that. 
I just, when are we going to break out of this hierarchy where only pilots? Uh, anyway, so she's bringing over a water, a glass of water, and Peter takes it. The father. <laughs> And halfway attempts to hand it to her as she stares off into infinity and then just sort of shrugs and then starts drinking it himself. <laughs> I mean, he's distraught too. <laughs> it's so good. What a what a dad move. I encourage you what to go back and just move. watch that bit just to see it again. Like when here? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> When your wife was in the hospital giving birth to your child, did you eat some of her snacks? I remember I remember my wife then bringing in like food and snacks and stuff for her and she had like a like a juice and eventually you having to go like, do, do you want that juice? I'll drink it. <laughs> I'm not doing anything, but I deserve a juice too, right? <laughs> Or some crane grape. We we had a slightly different situation, but I can understand that. Ours was like, I don't want any of this, and I assume you don't either. I'm gonna go get something else. Mm. You you provided. I mean, it's not like I had to go much further than the lobby. You know, I didn't have to brave the storm. Yeah, the Hooters is right right across the street from the. Your... And I had a gift card, so. <laughs> Did we give you that gift card? <laughs> oh, that was spent long ago, man. I'm I'm three gift cards past that. <laughs> I'm sure I've gotten some holiday bonus or something at this point. Uh, but I can at least understand that concept of like, you know what? He's my son too. I'm sad, I guess. I'm, I, yeah, I think I'm. I think I'm going through something. I've heard a little treat. <laughs> I think it's also like a uh, well. If you're not going to drink it, then I will. Like regardless of whether he's earned the treat or not, it's just like. I'm not going to hand this to a woman who is just. Yes, he's doing everyone a favor by not like forcing it. But like, take it. Kate take doesn't it. have to hold the water. The flight attendant still feels helpful. Right. You don't want to have to send it back to the flight attendant. Hey, get rid of this for us. I know we asked for it, but get rid of it. Have you ever sent back a water in any context? <laughs> Um, no, I'm even thinking of, of a specific incident where the glass of water I got was clearly very, very dirty. The glass itself was, was just grimy and gross. I just put it off to the side, just didn't drink it. See, this is how lucky we are. Like the majority of the time someone brings you water and like, oh, are you going to find a home for this? It's like, yeah, someone will drink this. Yep. Like yep. we assume pretty clean, filtered enough. Even if you're picky like me with water, you make it cold enough, I'll drink it. In what way are you picky about water? I mean, I'm not going to drink Deer Park. No. Or Dannon, Nestle. Mm, yeah, I get it. Mm. But Leslie. Well. I'm sure everything's okay. <laughs> hey. Um. Well, uh, we have a sponsor this week. It's Deer Park Water. Deer Park Water. Let's see. For your fresh water needs drink, Deer Park. It was put in a bottle by a deer. In a park. <laughs> deer Park is gross for some reason. I, I was why. worried you were one of those where you were going to be like, what do you mean? It's just water. Oh, no. There's a difference. Because as a person who also participated in the coca-cola challenge <laughs> yeah that we ace you have taste buds and know how to use them <laughs> yeah i'm a man of culture have taste buds will travel do you think you could do a bottled water taste test i have done yeah. i picked out deer park as yeah as being the one that tastes like garbage yeah um it was pretty easy though because the other two uh it was it was three well technically it was four because somebody put in tap water but i was like i'm gonna know what that one is but the other two were pretty easy. So I had Deer Park, Aquafina, and Dasani. Mm. And I was like... Deer Park is easily different than the other two, yeah. for sure. Yeah. But... Uh, Dasani's got a flavor to it. It's the most mineral heavy. Yeah, it's salty almost. Mm -hmm. Aquafina would, was, we'll say, very pure in contrast. You know, I'm... Um, I'm from Coke country. I'm a Coca-Cola man through and through, but Aquafina, they, they know what they're doing. It's very nice. Pepsi bottles are good water. I'm, I'm somewhat agnostic on the red blue bit there because I think Aquafina is really good, but especially in the early morning, I like a bit of mineral in the water. Mm -hmm. So Dasani is. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. Dasani is like I'll my go first half of the day water. <laughs> then you, then you switch brands yeah. in the PM. Aquafina is my PM water. Yeah, your Pepsi Meridian. 
But most most flights, American Airlines, we would assume probably going to be Coca-Cola, so probably Dasani. In this era, they didn't have that. No, no. But if this flight's happening today, that's Dasani water. So I can see why he intercepted it. <laughs> she, she doesn't need all this salt. I'll take it. I'll take it for, for the team. I'll do the drinking for us, Kate. Don't you worry. Ha- last last question. Uh, yeah. We, we leave off with Leslie assuring her that everything is okay. Like, she's mm-hmm. sure that everything's okay. Yeah. Because she knows any more than anybody else. Yeah, these are sort of empty empty uh, assurances. Is that helpful? No, but we do it anyway. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Emotion, I suppose. Comfort. Do we think that Leslie's doing it from a pure place? Yeah. What what malicious intent could she have here? I don't know, but she's lying. <laughs> she can't even use the phone. Only the pilots can. And she's sure everything's okay? Mm, these are these are the things that human beings say make the people they care about feel better. But doesn't that in turn make it feel even worse if everything's not okay? Let's get those expectations <laughs> back up. Oh, Kevin's dead. <laughs> It's just a comforting thing to say. I don't know why you got to get all sound like a Big Bang Theory character. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to burn you. Yeah, that's rough. <laughs> that's like what I don't I I think I have to be more vague in order to not be insulting, but that's the type of thing a certain type of person thinks smart people are like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um terrible show. But yeah, I yeah, she's saying it. it she doesn't mean it or know it, but she has to say it. She has to do something to make Kate feel better here. You know what? I'm actually going to walk back on that because what we'll experience next minute needs the contrast. <laughs> yes. We'll, we'll dig into it there because I think we're about to get a different take that is just horrible. So if you'd like us to stop talking about minutes into the future, drop <laughs> us a line at the Home Alone Minute at Gmail. Is it dot org? No, no, it's a it's a dot com. It's a commercial enterprise. Good for them. <laughs>